All right, before we, before we uh, unroll the code, I'd like to um, point out one thing that we didn't mention when we scheduled the code. Everybody here should see that the store here still uses the exact same address as the load. So get it out, work on it, put it back is the basic order here. And then change the value of S1. But the problem was that um, this store and this add need more distance. And so what we did was we scheduled this in between, or this one, I forget which one. We moved the store down. And if you move the store below this one, you've changed the value of S1 before you use it. So nobody objected, but there should have been an objection. Look what's going on here. We're storing back to a different address. And the reason we're doing that is because we've already changed the address. Now, why do we do that? In order to put more distance between the store and the thing that it was dependent on, okay? But when you do that, uh, you need, since you've already changed it, look what we're doing. We're putting the four back in order to re be sure that we're storing back to the same address that we fetched from. This address and this address are the same because S1 changed and now we are adding four to the value that's been decremented. So in the end, it's the same thing. But you should have noticed that. The purpose of this is to compensate for that. Well, why do we have to have it here? Ha! Ah, so that we uh, break the dependencies and avoid the stall. Okay, so we've now got scheduling that doesn't have a stall, but you notice we modified the code slightly in order to have the same effect, but to be able to put it in positions that we want. That principle is the principle you're going to see now big time in the um, unrolled code. What is the principle? You can modify the code in order to compensate for the fact you changed its position as long as it does the same thing in the end. Right, this does the same thing, but it had to be modified because we changed its position. If you remember in the original code, this came first, then this. This was the increment right before the branch. This was the second to the last instruction. Now it's the second to the first instruction. Principle being, you're allowed to modify the code. The compiler is allowed to modify the code when it schedules it. Now let's start to unroll the loop. We got, yeah. Yeah. We modify S1 after we use it. Use it, then modify it. Use S1, now change it. In the scheduled code, we change it first, then we use it. And obviously, you have to put a 4 here to compensate for the fact that you changed the order. That's what I'm saying. OK, now, everybody look at this. It took us four clock cycles to execute five instructions. So we can get a CPI and an IPC from that very easily. The CPI is 0.8. But our best case, if we'd filled them all, would be 0 0.5. Our IPC, instructions per cycle, is now 1.25. Our best case would be 2.0, right? So we're not very close to the best. The no ops that we had to put here, here, and here, of course, those don't count toward performance. So we've got a, a CPI of 0 0.8. Let's see if we can do better. Let's unroll the loop. I described to you before the break what loop unrolling is. It's making multiple copies of the loop body, not the loop control instructions, not the loop counter and the test, but the body, the actual work in the loop, making multiple copies of it. Um, and then instructions from different iterations can now be scheduled together in a better way. Instructions from different iterations. You know, the first time through, maybe an instruction from that, and the third time through, maybe an instruction from that can be packaged together. Ha, huh, great. Why not? That's a great idea. What we're going to do is we're going to unroll the loop four times. You're going to see four iterations, which would be what? Four loads, four adds, and four stores, meaning 12 instructions, will be now the body of a much larger loop, OK? And we're going to schedule that code. That'll eliminate unnecessary loop instructions. For example, right now, my code is a five instruction loop. Three are body and two are loop control. If I run that loop four times, how many instructions do I execute? 20, right? 4 times 5 is 20. If I run this unrolled loop one time, I still do the same work of 4 passes through the body, but I'm going to have 12 plus 2, 14. So it's in place of 20 instructions, I do 14 instructions. So it's faster to unroll loops too. The only thing it's not is smaller. It's bigger. It makes the code bigger, but it runs faster. And it schedules better for parallelism. So now you get the idea that smart compilers are going to look at your loops and they're going to unroll them and they're going to say, ha, 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 let me show you how to do it. Okay, those guys, don't, humans don't know anything about performance. Let me do it. I'm a machine. Okay, 
Now, we do the uh, unrolling in the compiler, uh, and sometimes we have to rename registers, okay? In other words, if the data is different, and we're just temporarily putting it in a temporary, it's not important that it be temporary 0 or temporary 1 or temporary 2. But if it causes data conflicts, because it always says T0, 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 the compiler is going to say, well, look, I know better than that. The first unrolling of the loop will use T0 as the temporary. The second unrolling will use T1. The third will use T2. And now we don't have any data dependencies that weren't real data dependencies. The fake ones from unrolling the loop can be fixed by register renaming. In other words, we eliminate all the data dependencies that aren't true dependencies from the loop itself, but then instead come from unrolling it. Those are YAPI dependencies. They're artificial. They're not true data dependencies. So now look here. Load, 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 load. Add, 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 add. Store, 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 store. And then change the loop variable and then test and see should I do it again. Does everybody agree this does what the other one does? Get four values out. Add the constant to those four values. Stick those four values back. It's sort of like you're doing four locations in the array at once inst instead of uh, one location each time for four times. OK, and then you need these at the end. But you don't need to have these four times. So you can see I've got 14 instructions instead of 20. That's my first gain. The second thing I want you to notice is, look here. Until I change S1, the first one is S1 plus 0. The next one's S1 plus minus 4, S1 plus minus 8, and S1 plus minus 12. Aha. And where am I going to put those? Temporary 0, temporary 1, temporary 2, temporary 3. Now I'm going to add the constant to temporary 0, zero temporary 1, temporary 2, temporary 3. And now I'm going to stick the values of temporary 0, temporary 1, temporary 2, and temporary 3 back to the same place it came from. S0, S0 minus 4, S0 minus 8, S0 minus 12. Do you agree that that's exactly what the original code does too? But it looks a little different because we had to change these values to do for it once, and we had to change these names to do for it once. So I've got register renaming. And I've got what we showed before, changing of the code slightly to make it possible to execute correctly. It does the same thing. It just looks a little differently. Everybody agree? Now, I am not telling you, learn to write code that way. Please don't misunderstand me. We have smart compilers. I wouldn't put that burden on you to say, think about unrolling your loops. Don't write tight loops. You know, this is very awkward looking, but it's very fast. It's much faster than the code that we looked at in the first one. And yet, if I took a poll here and said, how many of you will ever write your loop that way? And nobody will raise their hand. They say, how many of you will write your loop that way? Well, you all raise your hand, right? I mean, in high level language. Obviously, you won't write an assembly. Get the idea here, though? The compiler, you're probably not going to write that either. You probably wrote some for loop in a high level language. And the point is, the compiler shouldn't make this. The compiler should make this. That's what the compiler should do for a VLIW architecture, for a VLIW architecture, because we're going to schedule this right now. Let me hold you back. We're going to schedule this now. I've got to put these 14 instructions into those paired slots. Let's see how efficient that we can be. Oh, oh I like it. Only two no-ops out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight instructions. 14 slots are filled out of the possible 16. So let's do a little quick analysis. How do we do here? You know all that. Those are obvious. Eight clock cycles to execute 14 instructions, giving me a CPI, oh, sweet, almost 0 0.5. Look at that. I like it. Locum, shake your give Come on, my eyes. It's almost, <laughs> almost 0 0.5. And this is almost 2.0. We did well. We did very well. Not we. The compiler did very well. Okay. Now, look what's been done here. There's my loop increment instruction. Change it by 16. I put that first. I can, and what I've got here is four loads and four stores. I filled up this side completely. There's my loop control instruction. There's my branch instruction. Here's my four adds. And everything has got a, these are all independent from each other. These are independent from each other. These are independent from each other. The only thing that's dependent is this one's dependent on that one. And they're both dependent on which one? This one. Got it? This, then this, two cycles later, then this, two cycles later. No problem. We're OK, Jose. Got it? Everything's cool here because it's all stretched out far enough in time that it won't cause any ha data hazards or control hazards in my pipeline. What about this? Remember, S1 
Can't change it right before that. Where did we change S1, my friends? <laughs> Way up here. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time. Okay. This principle of loop unrolling in order to get performance is something I want you to know. I don't want you to say, yeah, this is advanced topics. <laughs> you know, bullshit. It won't be on the exam. I want you to understand there's something very powerful here and is a hardware but mostly software thing. The hardware thing is we're offering parallelism. The software thing is let's <coughs> squeeze that sponge, get those drops of parallelism out. We're extracting maximum parallelism here. We worked a little harder. We worked a little harder. Everyone in here would agree that, hold you, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. I don't understand why you're doing that. Well, I hope you understand it when we get to the good stuff right here. Here, have a piece of locum. 0.57. That's sweet. That's good. That's worth doing it. You got it? If you like to eat the sweet, you have to work for it. Okay, there's the sweet. Any questions about this? Yes, you had one. We're Um, let's do that analysis. If I was to unroll it and put eight per loop, then how many total instructions would I have? No, no, no. Eight, eight iterations per loop. Eight times three is 24, two more is 26. How many of these kind of instructions would I need to have those 26? I've got eight per loop, right? Right. So that means what? Eight loads and eight stores, right? Yeah. So how many? So how many of these would I need? Sixteen. Okay, great. How many would be filled? How many would be filled? All of the right-hand side with eight loads and eight stores. Tell me about the left-hand side. One loop control change, one branch, and eight. Adds. That adds up to 10. So how many empties would there be on that side? Six empties. So now it's six no-ops out of 32 possible spots. What I have here is two no-ops out of 16 possible spots. It's getting worse instead of better from an efficiency point of view. But let me explain something that's even much worse than that. Okay, great. So now you have your loop unrolled in groups of eight. And you decide that you're going to run your loop 100 times. Okay? If you have it in one, you'll go through the loop 100 times. If you have it in sets of four, you'll go through the loop 25 times. If you have it in sets of eight, you'll have to go through the loop 13 times, and there'll be a little problem, won't there? Because there's extra instructions you don't really want to execute, but you have to execute them. So the compiler won't do that. That would give you wrong data. That would give you 102 iterations of the thing, and you only want 100. What will the compiler do? You know, you have this little loop that says do it a hundred times. What will the compiler turn it into if you're unrolling into groups of eight? Maybe extra, uh, if you instructions. That's right. It'll have an unrolled group of, of, of eight and tell you to do that 12 times, and that'll give you 96. And then what will it do? A small second loop with a group of, not a loop at all, just a, a do it four more times. Yeah, it'll have to start patching in order to, to do that. So. There's some reasons why Kojimon unrolling doesn't actually gain us any efficiency, and it actually causes some additional headaches and problems. So, so your, your question is, why doesn't the, I guess you're saying, why doesn't the, compi why doesn't the compiler have loops at all? You write loop in high level, Boschware loops, let's just have Kojimon amounts of, yeah, okay, we can do it with no branches. I can do this code with no branch. How do I do it? You tell me how many times you want to execute, I'll write that. But now you said you have to tell me how many times you're executing. Do we always know in advance how many times a loop will run? We don't know, do we? We don't know how many times in advance a loop will run. Depends on data very often. Try this. 4i equals 1 to 100. You know how many times it's going to run. 4i equals 1 to n. We don't know how many times it's going to run. n is a variable. That you, you get it? So it, there's some reasons. But the most important reason is the one I just showed you. If you unrolled it to 8, you'd have more blanks, more no-ops than you do now. So the actual percentage of efficiency here actually starts to drop. Really 
but you're in a loop. So if I have this loop and then I say do these one time and I stick those inside my unrolled loop, now I'm doing them multiple times. So that's not good. Yeah, that's, that won't help. Okay, your question. It's in the clever compiler algorithm, which is at least as smart as you and me because it's written by a clever algorithm writer, okay? <laughs> I mean, obviously humans write algorithms, and so somebody br bright said, let's don't be stupid and cause pseudo data dependencies. So therefore, it changes these lo location names to get rid of the pseudo dependencies. Can everybody see that if I didn't do this and wrote T0, 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 and T0, 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 I'd have a big problem, wouldn't I? All kind of weird data dependencies, and they're not real. The ones that are dependent are this one goes to here, and then we write it back here. This one goes to here, and we write it back. You get it? There's, there's four sets of s dependencies from a load, an add, and a store, and they're independent. Those four sets are independent. Yes, this is dependent on that and that, I agree. But naming them all T0 doesn't make this one also dependent on that and also dependent on that and also dependent on that. It's a pseudo dependency. It's not real. It's not a real dependency. So what if the, the, the array sizes not by static range? Oh, we have dynamic array. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, no. No, think about it. You know, a compiler that doesn't know how big the array is uh, and is told uh, do this operation for every element in the array can only have a variable for when to stop, okay? Can only have a variable for when to stop. So I guess I think that we should pass on that question and, and move on, okay? All right, so loop, loop unrolling. It's, I'm, I'm just trying to give you the basic idea. We're not trying to te teach you how to write it. But if you go look in uh, resources on loop unrolling or parallel uh, instruction level parallelism, you'll find this all over the place. This is an advanced technique, but it's become so common now it's a normal technique. You know I mean? So you just be aware that when you push the compile button, you know, or you say, you know, update or whatever on your project developer, you're causing this kind of thing to happen now more and more. Remember we talked about optimizing compilers and what they do? Now we've got to have an optimizing compiler for an advanced architecture. This is all, of course, about an advanced architecture. If we didn't have this and this going on at the same time, we wouldn't be talking about this, but we do. We have anywhere from four to eight pipelines now in parallel available to do this kind of work. So now let's just take it the next step. This is just really simple. This is a MIPS with two, but real machines don't stop at two. They go six, four, eight. Etc. So now, compilers therefore need to do the following: pack groups of independent instructions together uh, into the bundle. You saw bundles of size two. In order to do that, we've got to do code reordering, okay? And it uses loop unrolling to expose more ILP, right? Okay. Exposing ILP means open the box and see where more parallelism could be done by Unrolling the loop, you get more chances to, to say, oh, I can reschedule this and put that there, and look, they're independent. Independent means they can be parallelized. Independent means parallel to All right? The compiler uses register renaming. We saw also register renaming here to uh, solve name dependencies, which aren't true data dependencies. They're just name dependencies. Ensure that you don't get any load use hazards. Now, Superscalers, that's the other kind, use dynamic prediction. The VLIWs, those are the static uh, uh, multi-issues, they primarily depend on the compiler for branch prediction, not on, on hardware, primarily. So loop unrolling reduces the number of branches. Did everybody see there that we reduced our branches from four to one by unrolling by a factor of four? You get less branches. Therefore, you have to make less predictions, and therefore your chance of a misprediction is less, everything's better by having less branches. Um, you can eliminate if then else branch structures if you predicate. Now predication is a new concept by replacing them with predicated instructions. A predicated instruction is like a conditional instruction. Okay, um, The compiler predicts uh, memory bank references in order to minimize memory bank conflicts. Okay, let me see if I can explain that for you a little bit. Imagine you have a memory, and you allow now multiple reads and multiple writes, just like the multi-ported register file. 
Okay, well, then a bank is a group of memory locations that can be thought of as independent from the other ones. So if I have a 4K memory, I could maybe organize it in four banks. So I, to avoid conflicts, don't want everybody writing into the same bank. I try to distribute over the banks to allow four reads and four writes going on at the same time. Makes sense. So instead of yon lashtering my data, I want to spread it out over the banks so that it's more independent. So the compiler will do that too. It'll choose memory addresses to scatter data in order to allow parallel non-conflicting access to that data in memory banks. Advantages and disadvantages, right? Very long instruction words, static, compiler-supported, uh, multiple-issue parallelism is simpler than trying to do it in the hardware. Lots, and therefore a lot less power is consumed because you spent uh, cycles in advance building the intelligence in through compiling instead of spending transistors on power and watts building the intelligence into the machine. Potentially it's more scalable, in other words can get bigger and, and for more parallelism. Uh, more instructions per bundle, you know, stretch that thing out potentially and just by adding more uh, functional units. Advantages. Disadvantages are the programmer or the compiler now gets burdened with the complexity and the compilation times get quite a bit longer in order to do the analysis to, to make those bundles as full as possible. Um, it has trouble when the pipelines get deep. Shallow pipelines are not too bad. Deep pipelines cause a lot of issues and you get long latencies. Those can be very confusing for this compiler to know, is it safe for this to still work with this is, or we have a hazard still or not? Okay, making peak performance elusive. In other words, if I have a deep pipeline and have uh, four words in my VLIW, getting anywhere close to a speed up of four becomes hard because of the deep pipeline. Right? Um, then the next disadvantage is everything has to work together. These two operations must be launched at the same time, the next two at the same time. Everything's lock-stepped. And so the problem is now we have hazards on this one, but not this one, causing everybody to have to stop. Okay, think about it. If, if this instruction causes a hazard uh, or an exception, and this one doesn't, oh, too bad for you, your partner over here is messed up. So um, the, the trouble with that is uh, everybody has to stall until the hazard is resolved. Okay, and that's why predication is a way to try to get around that. Second thing is object code incompatibility. You write a MIPS program or you write a C program and you compile it into MIPS, let's say. The object code that's going to run on a single pipeline MIPS doesn't look anything like the stuff that has to run on double pipeline MIPS. I mean, the thing that we just showed. So the, the, suddenly you can't just take the exe file and run it here and run it there. In other words, it's not just the machine that's changing. Remember I told you about the nice stage called the ISA? If you write the code, if you give it, no matter how it's implemented, it'll run. Well, now we've broken that rule, haven't we? Because you can imagine the object code and the exe files here are going to be quite different if you're doing this VLIW business versus if you're not. And just a single instruction to go fetch it is different. It's twice as long. So, um, and, and we've got reordering and renaming of registers, all kinds of stuff that you just saw that means that the single pipeline version of it is not going to be compatible at all as a binary to go and run on. So you upgrade your hardware. Oh, hey, I got this fast, you know, VLIW architecture now. Boy, it should go much faster. Well, all your programs don't work that you already wrote. You have to recompile everything. That's, that's called binary or object code incompatibility. You don't like to do that, especially if you've got a large installed base of software. Needs lots of program memory bandwidth because now you're really pulling large quantities of um, memory, uh, uh, especially program from instruction memory. So you, the bus has to be able to support a lot more, especially as these get really big. 144 bits at once, or 128 bits at once is a lot of fetching. And then code gets bigger, called code bloat. And a lot of it is no ops, as you saw, but it's just going to shish up your code. Uh, no ops are wasting program memory space. And when you loop unroll to expose more ILP, it uses more program memory because it makes the program bigger. So all these things, the parallelism of it, the extra no ops, and then the loop unrolling all make the instruction much, much larger. So these are some of the disadvantages. These are some of the advantages. Any questions? We've kind of given a quick review of VLIW, uh, introduction at least. Uh, do I always want to uh, exchange memory space with uh, performance? 
Um, we don't always, but very often we do. Most people, most people these days feel that transistors are pretty cheap. And memory's cheap and hardware's cheap, and you can, you can add stuff into the hardware of your processor, make extra functional units, make more memory, make extra ports, uh, and it's worth it to do it to get performance. Most people feel that way, but it depends on the customer and the application. There's places that are price sensitive, and smaller is better, okay? And costing less is better, particularly embedded applications. So not all computers have $500 or $5,000 or $50,000 budgets. Some of them have $5 budgets. So you've got to have a whole computer for $5. In that case, every transistor counts. And then, as we said in the beginning of the course, even if the money doesn't count, even if I've got a wonderful little $500 you know, transistor you know, uh, computer toy in my hand, I don't want it to burn much power, do I? I want its battery to live a long time. So even if I got 10 billion transistors, I don't want them to burn you know, 100 watts of power. I don't even want them to burn 10 watts of power. So power issue has a secondary effect on the whole issue of, of space. But primarily, time is the driver. Primarily, let's save time, let's go fast, is the, f you know, yeah. Uh, then, uh, 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 let's move on. OK. All right, so but you understand, didn't you, that we're claiming here that we spend extra time in advance compiling in order to save time when we run. That's the, okay. that's the idea. Uh, so does, can a compiler uh, understand uh, or know my memory space and act on it? Or, uh, sure, sure. Compilers are made aware of all the resources that they're targeting, not just the processor and how many registers it has, but also memory. Yeah, compilers are aware um, in... We'll get to it in more in the operating systems course, but even in this course when we talk about memory, we will start to talk more about the issues raised in your question. But I bet you weren't even listening to his question. You all were having a nice discussion there. Look, I'd like it if you'd pay attention when we have especially class discussions. He's asking something that maybe you should be asking or should be thinking about or would have thought about or never thought about but need to know. I mean, come on. This, this is an interactive class, so just because somebody asks a question and I turn and talk to them does not mean that, oh, great, class is over, we're on break time again. We just had a break, now it's time to concentrate, okay? Come on. All right. uh, anything else? Thanks, those are good questions, John. Others? So we're kind of wrapping up VLIW here. Any conceptual things or detailed things that you'd like to ask about the principles or the practice? As much as I can answer, I will. Well, also, the compilers can work uh, different missions like uh, AMD processors and uh, Intel processors, or the operating systems like Windows and uh, Linux. So uh, how can we recognize these uh, structures and behave like? Well, um, uh, generally speaking, compilers are multi-target, okay? So if you buy a compiler, um, you, you have to tell it information about the target and of um, the many platforms that it's aiming for, it can do that. So the other thing that they can do is they can generate code, which the first thing it does is ask the processor, which version are you and which manufacturer are you, and then the code uh, will adjust itself to that. We're going to see here that the next way to do it is to have the platform itself have the intelligence. And so now it doesn't really care what kind of code it gets. It's going to optimize it in the hardware level. But in this example, where the, everything is really dependent on the compiler doing it well, not only the questions he raises about what operating system am I working in and what platform am I aiming at, but now the issue is not just AMD versus Intel, but which AMD, which Intel, you know, what kind of resources have I got, off-chip or on-chip uh, caches and, and uh, how much memory as was raised over here. But now even more, have I got one pipeline or two or three or four? You know, all kinds of things come up. And remember, the code that you give has got to run on the machine. And we just made the comment here, code is now not portable anymore. So that means compilers now have to be able to uh, specifically target. Uh, and you have to know in advance, but you telling it this code is going to be for a VLIW, so therefore, generate it that way. This code is not going to be for VLIW, generate it that way. Source is the same. Compiler is saying, OK, I got the source, but what's my target? And obviously, it has to know that. Um, yeah? Uh, so VLIW is the architectures that uh, support backwards compatibility? No, of course not. No, of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. No backwards compatibility. That's what this means also. No backwards compatibility. The object code runs here, won't go anywhere else. Anywhere else's object code will not run here. That's, that's what we mean. Yeah. Uh, will we be able to do static and dynamic uh, together? Uh, uh, in theory, I suppose, yeah. In practice, 
it's usually one or the other. Um, I, I don't know of anybody who's tried to hybrid static and dynamic together. I'm sure it's been researched and people have gotten their master's and PhD thesis based on that, but I don't know of anybody who's actually implementing it commercially. Okay. All right. You know what? I think we're not going to do that. I think we're going to dismiss a little early. And we'll have a one hour class next time. We'll do what you saw, which isn't very much. And so, when would you like to come? <laughs> I mean, your choices are, your choices are, your choices are, no, I, no, let's get done. Let's get this. Let's do it. It's not. I'm going to push a little bit fast here, but we'll just get done. That's right. We're, we, we, I, I won't push it on. All right, here we go. Um, we're now looking at dynamic multiple issue machines, and we're going to call them Superscalar. That's their nickname. Just like VLIW was a nickname for static, Superscalar is, the, is a nickname for these dynamic ones. And we're going to use hardware at runtime to figure out um, how many instructions to issue and which ones to run simultaneously. So we're going to fetch instructions, and we're going to decode them, and we're going to issue them to a function unit which is ready to uh, execute them. That means that I'm going to have to look ahead in my instructions and have several and then be able to uh, issue them. I have to um, fetch, decode, and issue instructions beyond the current instruction because I'm sending multiple one. In the last one, I fetched one big one and got several at once. But now I need to get groups of them and they're little. So I've got to get more than one. So it's the idea of prefetching or fetching ahead. And then the next thing is instruction commit. When it is safe to write back the results. In other words, in your pipeline, you're computing something, and it's a result for T0. And in my pipeline, I'm, I'm uh, computing something, and it's a result for T0. And so we're both going to change T0. Does the order matter? You change it first, then I change it? Or I change it first, then you change it? The answer is it matters very much. What did the original code say? Who was the last one to write it? That's what it has to be in hardware. But let's say that the last one to write it is supposed to be me, because my instruction is second, and yours is first. But you're in a slow pipeline, and I'm in a fast one. Things go slowly for you and fast for me. So I get mine done. Should I write it? No, because then your write will come later. So I have to hold my commit. This is called the commit. The commit has to wait. Even though I have the result in my hand, I have to wait. Now, in fact, what happens is it gets put into a scoreboard, a kind of a temporary place, so that that function unit can be free for somebody else to come and do it. It's done. It's done its work. It's just we can't push it back into the final place. So the order of the commits, we have both in order and out of order commits. We have scoreboards. There's some ways to handle this. But the thing that's being talked about is when do you commit? When do you actually write back the results to a place that makes a permanent change? Okay. When do you change the state of the machine? That's called the commit. Okay. Now. Instruction fetch and decode units are required to issue instructions in order so that the dependencies can be tracked. So we fetch and we decode and we understand the order. We remember that so we know who's dependent on it. But the commit and the commit unit is required to write the results uh, uh, in order so that if exceptions occur and if branches are mispredicted, we don't, you know, fall apart. See, these are tricky things. Mispredictions of branches, oops, come back and go the other way. Exceptions that can occur, but oh, we didn't really take them. So you've got issues there. Although the front end, the fetch, decode, and issue, and the back end, the commit of the pipeline, run in order, the function units can be out of order, just as I was explaining to you. Uh, the function units can be free to handle things in any order they like, because they're just computing. They're not writing back. So the front end fetches and decodes in order to know the dependencies. Then the order can change any way it likes in terms of the execution, as long as when we write it all back, it ends up in the right order on the right back. So we've got in order commit and in order fetch decode, but out of order execution. That's the idea here. Okay? And that out of order execution gives me freedom to speed things up. It gives me freedom to speed things up. In other words, from my original set of, of code, I could say, you go, you go, and now you'll go because we finally have the resources you need. I'm not, I'm not waiting on this one and stalling these. If this one can't go, I say, you go, you go, you go. Eventually, I'll get back to you. I can have out-of-order execution. That's the key here. 
Out of order execution increases the amount of instruction level parallelism. In other words, let's, let's put it in a traffic term. Raise your hand if you drive a car sometimes. Raise your hand if you drive a car and get stuck in on car traffic sometimes. Wouldn't you like, when you're stuck, to have a little helicopter blade on the top of your car go <laughs> right over the top of all those other people that are sitting? It'd be lovely. I've thought that many times. A, a helicopter car. Just lift me up, get me over the jam, the little fender bender up there, or all the people that are looking over at the policeman giving a ticket, or whatever the problem is. Get me over that and back on the empty road, and off I go. Well, now that's exactly what we're going to do here. Instructions that are stuck because of somebody no, let's do it this way. Stuck because of somebody who's jamming up can just helicopter over it and go. As long as we understand the dependencies and don't mess those up. And as long as we're careful about the commit. Out of order execution. All right. Now, did we have any out of order execution here? Did we have any out of order execution here? We did. Remember? There's quite a bit of order changing here, isn't there? So we're already doing that. We analyzed and then we did it. But we analyzed in software here. What we have to do is have hardware now to do the analysis, the same kind of analysis in the machine. Okay, so here we come back. Hello. Oh, so many buttons. All right. So let's talk about out of order execution. Um, with out of order execution, a later instruction may execute before an earlier instruction. So that the hardware needs to be able to resolve both the read before write and the write before write data hazards. Okay? So we've got this changes this, and then we use it, and then we change it again here. So two different changes in the value of T0. Can I switch them? You can imagine that's part of the question here. If the load word write to T0 occurs after the uh, add right, then the sub gets the incorrect value because I change it and then I use it here. I want to make sure I get that value down here. So there's a dependency there. These are independent. The order could change, but I just have to remember that that's the one that I want. Remember? Okay. So the add has an output dependency on the load word, right before right. This right needs to happen before that right, and if the pipelines, the parallel pipelines, have different uh, speeds and this one gets somehow ahead, and I write this first, I have to not do that. I have to hold or not commit. The issuing of the add might have to be stalled if its result could later be overwritten by a previous instruction that takes longer to complete, or like I said, put it in a temporary scoreboard and, and fix it later. Okay, now there's another thing called anti-dependencies. Anti-dependencies are when a later instruction produces a data value that destroys a data value used as a source in an earlier instruction. Look here. This destroys the data value. It changes R3. But we used R3 here. Can everybody see that if this one gets excited and runs fast down its pipeline and executes too quick, and this one is executed later, this will be different. And if this is different, then I'll get the wrong answer here. I want the original value of R3 here, and I want the original. This is, should go there, but should also go there. That R3 is the source for both that and for that and for that. So I don't want this changing the R3s that I see here and here. But there are three instructions and they could execute in any order. So I've got issues. You can see here. This is called an anti-dependency, that one there. This is a true data dependency and that's an output dependency. All three of them are shown. Do you see them? Let's look again. We've seen this before. Write it, now use it later. That's a data dependency. This is called an anti-dependency, which is Read it now, write it later, but if things get really out of order, this could happen first before that. Get it? It's kind of like this one. There's chop ras. Both of them are chop ras, but one is first you write it, then you read it, and you don't want that to get changed. And this one is first you read it, then you write it. You also don't want that to get changed. So if this instruction is somehow executed before this one, the anti-dependency will be a problem. And the last one is the two green circles I just talked about, output dependencies. This has got to happen second, not this. So those three kind of things, true data dependencies, anti and output dependencies, must all be taken care of in the hardware. Whoa, it sounds like these transistors better be pretty smart if they're going to be taking care of all these to avoid having problems. Okay, so the constraint of anti-dependency is very much like true data dependency, except it's reversed. Okay. And I won't go into any more on that. We've explained it. Okay, so each of these data dependencies manifests uh, itself through the use of registers. It's really about the name of the register that you chose, okay, or other storage location. 
True dependencies represent the flow of data and information through a program. True dependencies. But I want you to look here. They're not all true dependencies. Does the name here really matter? Or does the name here? Think about it. Could I change any of these R3s and still accomplish the same thing? The answer is yes, I could. Yes, I could. If I were to change these both to R4, would anything be different? If I were to change these both to R4, would anything be different? No, it wouldn't be, would it? That can be R4, but it has to be the same, whatever I choose, but it doesn't have to be R3. That's a true dependency. They're related to each other. They're actually not related to that or to that. Understand? That's what we're saying here. You can rename, but you have to be careful about what you do. Okay, so, anti and output dependencies arise just because of the limited number of registers. We could change their names and it wouldn't change anything, okay? That means that programmers reuse the same names over and over, leading to computations which have storage conflicts. They're really about storage conflicts, not data dependencies. So, storage conflicts can be reduced or eliminated uh, by increasing or duplicating the troublesome resource. Let's say that, let's just say that in the machine we have a hundred register names. There's really only 32 registers, but we allow the name set to go really big. We can get rid of the anti-dependencies and the output dependencies by allowing ourselves to have flexibility with more names. Yeah, it's not a real problem. It's just a problem because the labels that you give it, and don't forget, in the middle of the computation, it doesn't really matter. I just got to make sure who's connected to who. All right, so register renaming. The processor now renames the original register identifier to a new register, and it doesn't even have to be a real one. It, it can be one that's not in the visible register set. It's just a name that we have locally in the processor, a place to store it. For example, here we go. Let's change that. This is R3A now, and this is R3B. So these two have to be the same R3B. We also went with R4A, which didn't really matter, but now this one's R3C, okay? And this, so I've got R3A, R3B, which has to be the same here, and R3C, but this and this can be independent from this name. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So now my anti-dependency, which looked like it's a big problem, now can be resolved with two different registers. See, now it doesn't matter if this is first or this is first because they're different. So there's not a problem between those two. Everybody see that? In other words, if this changes R3C, I don't care. But I'm using R3A. Won't hurt me. The only one that still remains is this blue one here. By renaming, I get rid of the output. I get rid of the uh, uh, anti-dependencies. Okay. So the hardware that does this renaming assigns a replacement register out of a pool of registers that, that we have and releases it back to the pool when it's done and there's no outstanding references to it. So we have this pool now of temporary registers that we can use uh, to put our data into and then get it back later. Okay, so let's summarize here. Extracting more performance. This is kind of the wrap up of the, this section of chapter four. I've tried to help you get the big picture now, the cutting edge picture of what's going on in processor design. I don't know how much you understood from these two hours, but I feel like no one should graduate from a computer engineering education and not know these principles. And I don't know if you recognize here, but these principles get into algorithms. We've got to have some really smart algorithms in the compilers. They get into intelligence. We're going to build it into hardware or the, or the algorithms. They get into data. Obviously, we're talking about you know, issues here related to data. Uh, they get into larger issues. This is not just a machine. This is computer science in the big. Okay? And you'll see more of it if you, as you continue in our department. So we've talked about super pipelining, where we just make really skinny stages and have a deep pipeline and make the clock go really fast. Didn't really like that because it's deep pipeline. The static multiple issue VLIW, the dynamic multiple issue superscalar. Spent a lot of time on, especially this one and this one to a lesser extent. The processor's instruction uh, <coughs> issue and execution policies affect the available ILP. Are we going to go with in order fetch, issue, and commit, and out of order execution, like in the superscalar? Um, are we going to allow out-of-order execution? So now we get anti-dependencies coming back in. Are we going to allow out-of-order execution that creates output dependencies? 
Are we going to have in order commit, which allows speculation, required to do precise interrupts? I won't even go there. Register renaming can solve these two. Nobody can solve that one, though. We've, we've come up against the brick wall on true dependencies, but register renaming can get me out of trouble on the output and the anti dependencies. Okay, here's what some superscalar and, and uh, uh, pipeline processors look like uh, from 89 to 2005. And what I'd like you to see is number of pipe stages got big, got small again, right? Right here, we got some really deep pipelines from our friend Intel, of course, always. Uh, in fact, all these, all these are Intel until right here, okay? But you can see that Intel kind of had a wake up and they started shrinking their pipe back at least a little bit uh, by 2006. These are Sun, and the Niagara is a, a multi core as well. Um, so you can see also what's been done is Intel stuck with the core until uh, 2006 and realized it's better to shrink the pipelines back, cut the clock speed back, and start increasing the number of cores. And same with Sun. In 2003, uh, they were going with single core. 14-stage uh, pipe at nearly 2 gigahertz, and by 2005, they'd gone to an 8-core, slowed the clock down, and shrank the pipeline down. Does anybody notice that uh, pipeline lengths are coming back down, clock speeds are coming back down, but what's going up is numbers of cores. And of course, we're now in 2010, so if you extended this, you'd just see the same graph go on. This, as you see it, is the end of single core, deep pipeline, high clock speed processors and the beginning of a whole new revolution. I told you about that revolution in the first week of the course. We talked about hitting the power wall. Remember that? Okay, that's what's happened here. Friends, at these kind of speeds, you are hitting the power wall. You're hitting, that, that's three and a half gigahertz. That burns a lot of power. You can't put your finger on that, I promise you. You'll burn it just like a light bulb, okay? A lot of heat to get out. Okay, so you can look at this. It's in the book. It shows you the power here. Shows you a number of other things. I'm, I'm going to wrap up with that being the last slide. Thank you for your attention and a nice tour through modern high-speed processors. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week on Tuesday.